great team win for us, necessary win. Uh, good to go into the bye on a positive note. Um, good to get an AFC North victory. Uh, a lot of positive contributions in, in, in all three phases. Welcome to the Steel City. Is everybody ready to go? Because we're playing the greatest radio show. Welcome fans to our Week 10 Steeler Recap. I'm Jim Sella in studio with Jay Dash and Big Easy. You just heard from Coach Tomlin talking a little bit about the Steeler victory over the Browns. Pittsburgh beat them pretty good, 30-9. to Biggest story coming out of the game, though, Big Ben Roethlisberger steps in as a backup and has the biggest day in NFL history as a backup quarterback. Yeah, ridiculous. I expected things to go a little different in this game, though, obviously, with Landry Jones starting a quarterback. And I know D'Angelo Williams was injured at the beginning of the week, and we weren't sure if he was going to play or not. But if he was healthy, I really thought they were going to come out and be able to run the ball pretty well. I mean, look what they did last week against Oakland. Oakland, one of the best teams at stopping the run going into that game against Pittsburgh last week. And D'Angelo Williams ran for what? 170-some yards or something like that? Believe it. And then we come into this week, well, first of all, the, the Oakland Raiders may not be that good against the run. They just got blown up for 200 and some yards against Adrian Peterson, obviously. But the Cleveland Browns are not very good at stopping the run. So I really thought D'Angelo would be able to get things going early and often in this game. And really, the Browns shut him down most of the game. What, the first three quarters, just one yard on eight carries or something one like that? One yard, eight carries through three quarters. But I tell you what, when Pretty bad. in the fourth quarter... He did start to get it going, really, when the Steelers needed to just control the clock and keep Ben from getting hurt. They started handing the ball off more, and D'Angelo did start breaking some big runs, ended up with 54 yards on 17 carries. So it, it, it wasn't a great game from him or anything, but when they really, really needed him, he stepped up and did the job. Now, Landry Jones, he had a couple decent short passes or anything, but it really didn't look like they were going to get anything going with uh, him him in a quarterback, and then Big Ben stepped in and was nothing short of spectacular. Yeah, I doubt we would have scored 30 points with Landry. I still think we might have been able to win the game, but there's no way he was putting up 379 yards and three touchdowns like Big Ben. Easy, did you know Ben just passed Kerry Collins for 13th on the all-time passing list? I did happen to see that. Uh, congratulations, Big Ben. You deserve it. He's, but, one, uh, he's one of five active quarterbacks in the top 13 in passing yards. Brady, both Mannings, Breeze, and Ben. What happened to uh, Landry Jones? What did he injure? His ankle. What's his status? Is he out? He's back up again. That's about <laughs> it. This was Ben's 41st 300-yard passing game. He's thrown a touchdown in 36 straight home games. Drew Breeze is holding the active record right now at 51 is Ben going to play 15 more home games with a touchdown pass? And is Breeze going to miss one in his is he next? he going to play 15 more home games is the question. That's only two he, more He years. really needs to stay healthy. But I do think this was his best game of the season by far. He, he only had a couple mistakes on that very first drive. He made a couple poor passes, hit one of the defenders in the back, I remember. And he did have the interception, which set Cleveland up for their only touchdown of the game. But the big difference to me between... Ben Roethlisberger earlier in the season and in this game was the way he just kept going downfield and it really helped this offense out. I mean, not just the plays that Brown and Brian came up with. Let's not forget what four pass interference calls for over a hundred yards. So 141. Yeah. So there you go. The deep ball can pay off in many ways. The Steelers have got burned historically on the deep ball on penalties, especially when the Ravens come to town. So it's finally nice to see them embrace that part of the offense and just chuck it downfield sometimes. Look what happens. Brown had, what, almost 109 yards in penalties, 141 total. If Ben got those passing yards, he's got another 500-yard passing game. Please believe. And he usually does play well injured. Yeah, I know there's the stat when he comes back from an injury, he doesn't play very well. But he plays injured a lot, and he always seems to rise to the occasion when he is injured. I don't know. It's just the haters going to hate. That's why. They just wanted a reason to Call hate him on Call him a crybaby. Said he, he could have started the whole time. Yeah. What I think is funny is an injured Ben Roethlisberger is your second quarterback other than a healthy Mike Vick. Greatest backup quarterback to ever play the game. He's 1-0 and has the best game as a backup in history, so he is the best backup quarterback. 
it's funny because he hasn't been a backup since his first two games of his first season. And he was a beast as soon as he did step in. Talking about beast, Antonio Brown had another huge day. 10 catches, 139 yards, and two touchdowns. He has the third most catches over two games in NFL history. He set a Steeler record for catches and yards in consecutive games. He passed Heath Miller for third all-time on the Steelers' receiving yardage list. And Brown and Ward are the only two Steeler wide receivers to have three consecutive 75-catch seasons. Yeah, when Le'Veon... A lot of records on Sunday. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just saying, when Le'Veon Bell went down, the, the one thing we said is they really have to feature Antonio Brown now. And that's exactly what they did when... When Landry Jones went down and Big Ben came in, Ben actually targeted Brown on the first play of his first three drives, and he came up with big plays on all three drives. Actually, there was a third and 15 on Ben's first drive, and he came up with a 16-yard reception. That drive obviously ended in three points. He came up with the four-yard touchdown. He added a two-point conversion after that to make the game 14-3. He had two pass interference calls on him back-to-back, -back, you remember, on the first drive of the second half, that resulted in 77 yards right there. So that puts him over 200 yards of offense contributed in this game. That drive ended in a field goal to make it 24-3. He had the 56-yard catch on the slant and run to make it 30-9. to And then on the very last drive of the game, he had the pass interference that took him down to the one-yard line. That was 29 yards. So right there, he has well over 200 yards of offense again this week, and he added the two touchdowns. That They have to keep featuring Antonio Brown in this offense, and then every once in a while, go deep to Martavis Bryant because we've seen what he can do too. What I think is crazy is last year, Brown held the record for most receiving yardage through 10 games with 1,070. This year, he struggled in the four, well, three of the four games without Big Ben. I think he had 100 yards in one of the games with Landry Jones in Kansas City. Yeah. But uh, the other games, he struggled. Even the one game with Ben back, he struggled a little bit for his standards. He now has 1,141 yards through 10 games, so he breaks his own record, and he's on pace for somewhere around 1,700 yards this year. Beast mode. Ridiculous. Easy. Any chance he gets to 2,000? Not if he keeps flipping into the end zone. <laughs> he stuck that landing, though, huh? That was ridiculous. That was awesome. He caught some hell for that in the locker room, from what I hear. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah, he like, likes to flip. I want to well then flip over somebody and score a touchdown, not just blade, not just like out of nowhere. I want to see him flip over the JJ <laughs> and, and run straight to the right straight to the zone. That would be ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Flip over Why Jacoby not? Jones because he's not worth anything else. Oh, Jacoby, they should have benched him. We don't, we don't <laughs> speak Jacoby on this recap. Least valuable player right now, Jacoby Jones. No waiting till the end. Please believe he only had one yeah. punt return for zero yards. He fumbled it at the 10-yard line. Almost cost him huge right there. If, if it had fumbled and the Browns recovered, scored a touchdown, the game could have turned out a little different. Where's Dre Archer when you need him? Please believe. He fumbled a kickoff return in the end zone, too. He, he was like eight yards deep, and it looked to me like he was going to take it out. The announcers actually said he wasn't going to take it out anyways, but it looked to me like he was ready to take it out from eight yards deep, and he fumbled and then just kneeled it. I'm worried about this guy just catching the freaking ball. Why is he in there? You would think he'd be able to at least catch it. Tomlin loves him. Doesn't make any sense. Uh. But you look on the opposite side of Antonio Brown. Martavis Bryant came up with his maybe his best game of the season that first game he came back he had a very good game and really he, he's been a letdown since then a couple big mistakes and he did have a mistake in this game he, he fumbled at the 14 yard line but he came up with a huge game six catches 178 yards and a touchdown and it was all big plays to him all day he had a 45 yard reception on Ben's first drive that that resulted in three points like I was saying about Brown he had a 64-yard reception on that fumble, obviously, at the 14-yard line. But it's not the worst thing in the world. It's no worse than a punt at that point. And it put him down in Cleveland's zone if you, you want to look at the bright side of it. Well, the bright side was it was a cool catch, man. Oh, it was an amazing down, catch. It was, like, right on the tips of his fingers. Like, what a catch. Yeah, it was probably one of the best catches of the Steelers this season. I know another one was Martavis Bryant in the back of the end zone from Landry Jones. So Martavis Bryant comes up with some big catches. But look, he had a 35-yard pass interference called as well 
that sent him down to the 14-yard line. That puts him over 200 yards of contributed offense as well. He had a 32-yard touchdown on the final drive of the half to make it 21-3, to and he had a 28-yard reception on the final drive to really keep the ball out of Cleveland's hands in the end. You remember that was a third down, and if they didn't get that there, they were going to punt, and they went deep to Bryant, and he ended up making the play, and that really ended the game. They could run the clock out from there. I don't know if I want to say this is the best game the offense has had this year because the running game struggled a lot until the fourth quarter. Uh. But this is definitely the best day for the passing game this year. This was the first time since December 2014 against the Bengals that the Steelers offense has produced a 300-yard passer and 200-yard receivers. When you look at it, if you have everybody for most of the season, you know, outside of bumps and bruises, maybe a game or two here or there, the Steelers should have been able to produce a 4,000-yard passer, a 1,000-yard rusher, and two 1,000-yard receivers. Now, obviously, Lev Bell's out. D'Angelo might get there. I doubt it. He, did, he lost a couple games, you know, when Le'Veon was in. But I still think that Martavis Bryant has a shot at getting to 1,000 yards receiving, and Antonio Brown's already freaking there, so it's easy for him. But this offense, it was nice to see that passing game live up to the potential that it actually has. And if they could have maybe got Heath Miller mixed up into the game a little bit more, or a third receiver, Dash, I know me and you were always talking about this, we need to get that third guy in there, either Wheaton or Darius Hayward Bay, they're going to make some plays, maybe two, three plays here along, you know, throughout a game, get a first down here or there, or even just hold their own route running so that you can't double up Antonio Brown all the time. Well, Heath. Yeah, you got Heath as your third pass catching option, but you still want a receiver because sometimes Heath has to block, especially when you lose your best blocking back. Yeah, this is a big game in the air, but you got to remember it's the Cleveland Browns. They were they oh, were yeah, without right. Dante Whitner. They were without Joe Hayden. Concussed, didn't even know where he was. Dante Whitner and Hayden both have concussions. So the two best laying on the mat with Ronda. Two Rousey. best players in their secondary out to begin with. But you've seen even without Le'Veon Bell, the combination of Big Ben, Antonio Brown, and Martavis Bryant can do huge things. But like you said, they really do got to find a third receiver in for, to put in there in the slot. Maybe it's Sammy Coates. Who knows? Maybe he'll step up next season. But really, Heath is my third option. Don't get me wrong. I love Heath. Four catches, 40 yards in this game. Had a 27-yard reception and an 8-yard reception to set up the Steelers' first touchdown drive. I love Heath, but... They really got to get another playmaker in there to take it to that level that they believe they are. They believe they're that 30 to 33 points per game type of offense. I really think they need that third receiver before that will really happen. Especially when they struggle in the running game like they did Sunday against the Browns. Yeah. I if you do Wheaton's that against capable. Them. What's that? I don't even think Wheaton's capable. I'm starting or to Dan, or believe Bay, or agree, whatever. To be like. the third, like little slot guy, is what you want or whatever. What are you talking about? A little route runner, like yeah. I, I never thought Marcus Wheaton was the guy. He's just not that type of player. Darius he Hayward is, Bay, he's, he's really not that type of guy you want either. He's a deep threat mostly. So really, they don't have the perfect guy for that situation, and it is definitely not Jacoby Jones. Yeah. God no. Dude, 6'4". I don't he's even think Sammy receiver. Coates really fits that role. I mean, he nah. might be able to do it, but his size and speed, he's more of an outside I guy. I agree. We, I mean, I know Wheaton isn't the prototypical, but he's probably the closest thing we had other than Dre Archer, and we cut him. Yeah, I think when they drafted Dre Archer, they really thought he was a guy that wasn't going to start at slot, but was a guy that <clears throat> you could switch in and out with Marcus Wheaton at the slot position. Didn't work out. Nope. The Steelers got away from this game relatively injury-free. Landry Jones obviously hurt his ankle, and Sean Spence pulled a hammy, tweaked a hammy, whatever you want to call it. Popped one. Other than that, I mean, they, they came out of this game, no major players went down, no MCLs torn, no feet smashed. And with the bye week coming up, it should be as healthy as you can be, all hands on deck going into Seattle. Plantar fasciitis. Peyton's forehead. <laughs> Broke foot. What about this defense, Dash? They had a big day. Six sacks. That's the most since 2014. They had two fumble recoveries, one pick, six QB hits. They even had nine tackles for a loss. That shows the defense knowing what they're supposed to be doing, trusting in each other and their teammates, and playing fast and playing hard and trying to make big plays. And it worked out because 
when this defense gets turnovers like it did in this game and some of these others, you got to watch out because this offense will really burn you. Yeah, you look, Johnny Manziel had his best game of his career, 372 <clears throat> yards, had a touchdown and an interception. He came up big in the passing game, but we said it before, if you can only pass and you can't run, it, you're not going to win a lot of games, and that's what the Steelers did. They they stopped the Browns from running in this game, just 14 carries for 15 yards, and they made them pass in this game. And although you can throw for 400 yards on his defense, they kept everybody in front of them, they keep teams out of the end zone, and they make plays, and they made a, a, a lot of plays in this game. Six different players ended up with at least half a sack. Timmons, Shazier, Hayward, and Tuit all had one themselves. Moats and Jones both busted out a half sack on their own. Moats Jones. <laughs> Moats Jones. Jones. The Steelers were credited with one team sack. Like you said, Dash, they only gave up 15 yards rushing. That's the second fewest allowed in the series versus Cleveland since September 12th, 1999. Yeah, I think they got away from Duke Johnson a little bit too early. you seen early in the game they were giving him the ball, at least on one of the drives. They were pretty much featuring him, and he was making some plays, and then they went back to Crawlwell and just faded out Duke Johnson in the game. And really, I think Duke Johnson is one of those three guys that they got to get the ball to out there, along with Barnage and Benjamin, who both had pretty good games. Manziel had a big run. What was it, like 15 yards or something? 16, I believe it was. And they only ended up with 15 yards rushing, so that just tells you how well the well, running Crowell had did. six carries for negative five yards. Nice. Manziel had a serviceable game. I'm not going to take it you away know, from him. He completed he passes. He very bad. But the yardage came because of the way the Steelers' defense forced them to play. You know they didn't come to Pittsburgh wanting Manziel to throw 45 times. No, that but was he was on target. Cleveland every game. He was on target, and he was throwing hard as well. I mean, he made his mistakes. He had that fumble Whoop. with the very first play of the game where he dropped back the pass, went to throw, and he dropped the ball, obviously. <laughs> that was great. And he had the interception, obviously, to Mike Mitchell at the goal line as well. But Cleveland has nothing around them. They're a mistake-ridden team. They're just a, a terrible team. I mean, they made so many mistakes in this game. And I want to go over these mistakes. Uh, look, on the first drive, Johnny Manziel fumbled, obviously. That cost them three points. On the third drive, they ran a reverse that lost seven yards to Travis Benjamin. That pretty much ended that drive there. On the Steelers' first drive, you remember the defense actually held him to a field goal attempt, but then got called for leverage, a personal foul on Armani Bryant to make it first and goal. That cost them five points because the Steelers ended up scoring and going for two and getting that. So there's five <laughs> points there. On Cleveland's fifth drive, Andrew Hawkins fumbled on the first play at the 36-yard line. That was forced by Will Allen, who had a huge game. Jarvis Jones recovered that fumble. They had back-to-back -back pass interference calls for 77 yards on a drive that cost them three points. And uh, on the second drive of the second half, their best drive of the game, that's when Johnny Manziel had that run down to the one-yard line. It was a great run. He broke like three tackles in the backfield and ended up, I thought it was a touchdown. He fell just short. It was actually a couple inches short. It wasn't even the one-yard line. But then after that, they scored a TD but it was called back on holding, and then they had a false start, and then Shazier had a sack, and then they gained some yardage, got to the 70-yard line, and Johnny Manziel threw the pick to Mitchell at the goal line. That was their best drive, and it ended horrendously, actually, but Benjamin dropped a TD pass as well late in the game, if you rem remember. They were unable to score after that, and all the penalties, obviously the four pass interference calls, and no pass protection for Johnny Manziel either, so he came up big. 33 for 45, with no pass protection, and you remember, they were putting Cleveland in third and long throughout this entire game, third and 15, third and 17, third and 18, and Johnny Manziel came up with a lot of first downs still, looking downfield, running out of the pocket, never stopped looking downfield, and throwing strikes to his receivers. That's so I, I, I give my backup. I give credit to Johnny Manziel in this game, and if he can play like he did here in this game, he does have a future in the NFL. See, for me, Manziel, <laughs> backup, I'm telling you. this game was the exception, not the rule when it comes to Manziel. He played well, but he also left a lot of plays on the field. And I'm not blaming all the sacks on him because his offensive line played really bad. But he lost 45 yards just in sacks. He lost the fumble. He lost the interception. You know, the yards and the completions were there, but we were basically giving him them underneath throws and then coming up to tackle the players. Again, I'm not taking anything away from him because he made the throws and he was a very accurate 
accurate passer, and I'm pretty sure he averaged a little over eight yards per attempt in this game, which is a very healthy average, you know, if you want to win football games. But I don't see him consistently playing like this. His style of football will eventually just leak through, and that's not a knock on him. That's just how those types of players are. So as far as Manziel goes, I mean, he played a great game. I'll give him that. I, I just don't really see this carrying over in his career. He's a running quarterback. He's going to run. I mean, it's just going to happen. I tell you what, though, if he has the accuracy he showed last game, and he has a lot more zip than anybody thought he did when you look at that game. In fact, I, I mean, I don't think I ever seen him had that, that kind of zip. I've seen him play in other games, obviously, and things just look different for him. Maybe he is taking a step forward, and let's not forget, like I said, Benjamin dropped a touchdown pass for him. He could have had two touchdown passes. He could have had over 400 yards passing. But even He's a so... a poor man's Colin Kaepernick. A poor man's Colin Kaepernick. I don't know. I, I I'll give it to Johnny Manziel just because I haven't seen enough from him yet. I've seen enough of Colin Kaepernick where I know it's just not going to work out with him. But you can't forget about some of the things this defense did. Obviously, all the sacks. But there were other plays where they set the offense up in good position too. You remember after the Steelers went up fourteen to three. Immediately after that, the first play, Will Allen forced the fumble at the thirty-six yard line. Jarvis Jones recovered, and the Steelers actually went down and turned the ball over at the one yard line. They went for it on fourth and one, and the Cleveland defense stopped them. But then the Pittsburgh Steelers defense went out there and didn't even let them gain a yard, forced them to punt, and it went to Cleveland's own 46-yard line with a minute five left and a half. And that was enough time for Big Ben in that offense to go down and get seven more points there. And like I said, Big Ben, the pick he threw, that set Cleveland up at the Steelers' 11-yard line. So the only touchdown that this defense led up in his game, it was an 11-yard drive. Yeah, it was almost given to him. When the Steelers went for it on fourth down, was that when they threw the fade pass to Martavis Bryant in the corner? Yes, it was. Garbage play call, Haley. I'm not saying they should have ran it because I knew they weren't running the ball that great in that game. You throw a quick slant on the inside. You let A.B. or Heath Miller or Bryant use his big body. You don't throw a fade on fourth and one. Maybe on third down I'm going to go for it and be okay with it. But that's such a low percentage play. That's not what you run on fourth down. Get it together, Haley. You're garbage. I always hated that play. In fact, they used to run that with Heinz Ward all the time. And it, it somehow worked out most of the time for some reason. But I'll tell you, I was saying a couple weeks ago that we haven't seen enough fades to Martavis Bryant down in the red zone. And they finally did it. But you're right, it was a terrible time. Worst fourth time. down, that's the worst time in the world to do it, actually. I'd have ran the ball. I mean, you need one yard. I know you weren't running the ball very well in that game. But we've seen throughout the course of the season, Cleveland couldn't stop the run. And if you can't get one yard against Cleveland on the ground... Forget uh, about it. Yeah, then yeah. you're garbage. <laughs> you mentioned a minute ago Jarvis Jones had a fumble recovery. This dude's got back-to-back -back fumble recoveries. Last game and this game. First time that's ever happened in his career. Yeah, actually, I was talking after the game with my brother, and he was really saying that Jarvis Jones isn't having that great of a season, and he's really not happy with him, mostly because of where we drafted him, obviously. Believe he was it. too high of a draft pick. But I'll tell you what, he's not having that bad of a season. He had a great game, one of his better games this season. But he's come up with plays here and there this season. If he ends up being your fourth best linebacker, I have no problem with it. But you do want more considering where he was drafted. But still, I don't hate Jones. I, he is better than what he showed the past couple seasons. you got to remember, too, Harrison, well-deservingly, is taking plays away from Jones. Harrison is earning these plays, so I'm not saying anything bad about him. But if Jones had all the snaps at that linebacker position, he may be making more plays than what we see. Although, if he's not doing it in practice, you know, and the coaches aren't letting him play all those games... You know, that's the other side of it that we don't really know. But as long as James Harrison is in town, he could be playing good or bad. And Mike Tomlin's going to play him because he's more in love with him than Jacoby Jones. Please believe. But real quick, on his defense, really, the like I said, the touchdown they let up, it was an 11-yard drive. They were put in a terrible situation. Really, the one play they let go was the 61-yard reception by Benjamin on the second drive of the game that set Cleveland up for that field goal other than that they kept everything in front of him we we said benjamin's the guy that can break a big one and that's what he did but really you take away that 61 yard reception and cleveland's offense really had nothing going in his game against his defense nope that's why pittsburgh was a lock 
They were a lock, especially since Landry Jones went down. Yeah. I wonder if the Cleveland coach said, whatever you do, do not hurt Landry Jones in his game. Because <laughs> Big Ben will come in and dominate you. And the Browns are so horrible, that's what the first guy did. Went yeah. right in freaking Landry's ankle. <laughs> well, it was he actually, thought it was Big Ben. He's like, it's a big white guy. Get him. Yeah. Hurry up. It was actually Gilbert that stepped on his foot. Well, we all know Gilbert's not the smartest of our offensive linemen. It was the smartest move he made this season. You're probably right about that. He might have thought it was like a chicken running away, and he tried to stomp on it and catch it and eat it. Oh, I heard Mike Tomlin say that they like kind of just went, and, you know, shotgun, no huddle, and all that, and just let Ben almost dictate the game play himself. You know what I mean? And well, I, I tell you that, what, that's if, why why didn't they never do that? If Landry Jones doesn't get hurt, they have no run game. This game could have turned out a lot different. Like I said, all these Cleveland mistakes, they cut down on those mistakes just a tiny bit. Landry Jones stays in the game. They still stop the run. This game is totally different than 30-9. to nine. Yeah. Might have been 14-6 to six, like I predicted. Possibly. I thought I was going to be right on the Cleveland side of the score. I said 10, and then the dude boots the extra point, and it misses wide like yeah. weak. Boswell missed one, too. Yeah. yeah. Boswell has the highest field goal percentage of a Steelers rookie or first-year kicker at 93%, something like that. Yeah, he's still beast. I don't care about the missed extra point. I know all his field goals in his game were short kicks, but he made them all, and they were all pretty much right down the middle. He didn't Boswell's boot, the man. He didn't boot one like Mason Crosby did. Did you see that one? No, I didn't. He was trying to kick one to win it for Green Bay, and it was probably the worst. It seriously looked like I kicked it. Like, I'm not exaggerating on how bad it was. It barely made it over the line and then just rolled. <laughs> I don't even think it rolled to the end zone. It was horrible. Choke under pressure. Least valuable player, Jacoby, Jacoby Jones. Jones. Most valuable offensive player. Big Ben. And I know there's three guys that could be deserving of this. You could go Ben Brown or Bryant, really, in my opinion. But I'm going to go Big Ben because he didn't even expect to play. He didn't really get a chance to prepare all week with the first-team offense. He kind of just sat on the sidelines and he did throw a little bit but he wasn't really on that foot he was in a walking boot all week long just took the freaking boot off standing there on the sidelines thinking he's gonna have a nice easy day then he comes in and has the best day as a backup quarterback in the history of the league this guy just never ceases to amaze me yeah they should name him the starter i'm gonna go with antonio name brown him jesus just because we said when Le'Veon went down that they have to start featuring Brown more. And when Ben came in, that's exactly what he did. Like I said, he started targeting him early and often, obviously, on the first three drives. He looked his way in the first play. And all these plays he came up with, the pass interference, one drive was 77 yards just on pass interference. And that was all Antonio Brown. He had another one for 29. This guy accounted for well over 200 yards of offense, like he did last week. And he also scored two touchdowns this time around. It's funny when him and Ben hit a couple plays early on. You can just see the defense start getting scared. And the defenders one or two steps back on Brown because they don't know what to do. They try to jam him. He gets around him. They stay behind him. He catches it in front of him and runs past him. I mean, this guy is almost unstoppable when him and Ben are on their game. What about you, Easy? Ben. Going Ben. He didn't think he was going to have to play that game and come out and made the throws necessary. It was probably really sore. It had to be beat up. Dude flipping into the end zone, I, I didn't care for it. And then uh, <laughs> Brian fumbling kind of turned me off to him. So the interception should have turned me off to Ben too, but he shouldn't even have been playing that game. Can, we can't even let him rest one week and heal a little bit, get healed. It's, it's sad to injuries. We're, we're beat up. The Steelers we need are the bye week. beat up. Perfect for the bye week. It's not even a lot of major injuries. We're just all beat up yeah, a little and bit. And the injuries like Le'Veon Bell, Marquise Pouncey, those guys aren't coming back anyway. Right. Yeah. Pouncey still may be back for the playoffs, I hear, but I'm not holding my breath. Defense. You know, I was going to maybe go Stefan to it because he helps control the run game so well and he had a sack in this game, but I think I'm going to go Lawrence Timmons. He had 10 tackles and a sack. I mean, this guy's your perennial middle linebacker that just comes up and does the job every game, never says anything. He started like his 75th career game in a row, has played in his like 97th straight game in a row. I mean, this guy is just solid as they come. They said that he had a toe injury coming into the season and he might be limited. Something like Patrick Willis was suffering from the last few years before he retired coming into this season. He doesn't look hurt to me. He just goes out there and dominates. He's leading the team or shared with the lead with Stefan Tuitt, four and a half sacks. 
Timmons all the way. Yeah, Timmons had a good game. Jarvis Jones had a good game. Ryan Sh- Shazier had a good game. Arthur Motes had a good game. He he ended up with a recover fumble and he almost ripped Manziel's what, what head a half off. Sack. Yeah, turned Manziel into a helicopter. <laughs> so the the linebackers had a great game, but I think I'm going to go with Will Allen in this game. He well deserved. Yeah, well deserved. Really, this secondary that I know they played above their head this season. But that's mostly the corners. The The two safeties are for real. Will Allen is a good, strong safety. And Mike Mitchell obviously stepping up a, as a free safety this season, looking more like he did when he played for Carolina. Although he's still a piece of garbage, personally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Will Allen, yeah, he, he was hitting hard in this game. He was all over the place. He came up with the forced fumble right after they took the 14-3 lead, and that really broke the back of Cleveland in this game. Pittsburgh safeties, they're for real. Timely plays. Yeah, the safeties, Big Will, Big Mike. And then Mike had that interception in the end zone too, right? So Please believe. They made plays, and I liked it. Is Jesse James going to keep his reception streak going after the bye? Oh, what is that, you two, didn't know? Two, two games, two receptions. As long as they keep confusing him with the heat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, he's, he's on the sidelines the going, they're, they keep calling me Heath. He you don't like, like it. it. Not at all. Well, since we all know Jacoby Jones is the least valuable player, Dash, I'm going to ask you this. Going into the bye week, do the Steelers do anything about the return game? Do they try to figure out something really in the punt game? I know Jacoby keeps dropping the kickoffs, but you got to think he's not going to keep dropping it. But the Who punt knows? game, you don't want Antonio Brown in there because Love Bell's hurt. So what do you do? Do you try to get somebody or do you just try to fix it with the time off? Well, if I'm coaching, I'm going out. And I'm talking to Dre Archer, be like, sorry, buddy, I didn't mean to do that. Sign him back and get rid of Jacoby Jones. If you don't want Dre Archer, fine, don't get Dre Archer. But J- Jacoby Jones isn't the answer. If I'm Mike Tomlin, I'm going to say, Jacoby Jones is a beast and he's going to run one back soon. And that's what he's been saying this whole time. Mike Tomlin loves Jacoby Jones. He's going to move forward with Jacoby and just hope it gets better and blame it on the blocking. You think Tomlin, Jones, and Harrison are going to go out and get some strange during the bye week together? Jacoby ain't getting nothing. Well, if he's hanging out with James Harrison, he might, because Harrison beats the women until they give it to him. Come on now. Hey, I'm not the one who does it. <clears throat> I've seen you beat things before. Never women. You're still, you're both beat things. <laughs> nothing to say. I hit things with a pillow. He punches women in the face. I don't think that's what he's talking about. <sighs> hey, I can hit it with a pillow. It still works. Anything else here today, guys? No. No? You took it too far. Right? Yeah. It should have been wrapped up about 30 seconds ago. Hey, yeah. man. I just do what I'm told. Fans, you can follow us on Twitter at bet underscore the spread. You can follow me on Twitter at bet Jim the win. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash bet the spread. Keep coming back to YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You got, do we get any comments on the Steelers recap or Steelers preview show this week, Dash? Not really. Someone thinking Landry Jones can actually have a good game. Obviously, he didn't get a chance to do it. Maybe he would have had a good game. Two drives, he didn't get anything going. But, I mean, you can't say he wasn't going to have a good game because of it. You never know what was going to happen from there. But this bored and blab guy did say the score was going to be 28-13. And that was pretty close. Yeah. Closer than I was. Good for you, buddy. Next week, the bye week. Tune in for our Steelers. Not really mid-season show, but, you know, bye week show.